Good morning, all. Thank you for uh, the early rise and uh, joining us for the first full day of our um, IC Congress um, 2030, Path to a Sustainable Future. For those of you that weren't here last night, um, I'm Evan DeLucia. I'm the director for the Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment. For those of you that were here last night, you heard a, a really uh, provocative, um, somewhat disturbing keystone from um, Dr. Stephen Coonan. Um, I think there were a number of people that would uh, take issues with some of the things that, that uh, Dr. Coonan presented. But uh, I think one of the things that, that we all agree on is that because of the long lifetime of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and our um, very dramatic use of energy, particularly from fossil fuels, that we have a really big challenge ahead of us in terms of our renewable energy future and, and the Earth's climate system. So I want to kick off today's Congress um, by introducing our, our Vice Chancellor for Research, Peter Schiffer. He's going to give some opening remarks to get us thinking about uh, our energy future. Peter? All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, so it is an honor to be here to welcome you to the University of Illinois and uh, to the third IC Congress. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to see this group uh, coming together to talk about the energy needs of all humankind uh, in this very interesting time in the Earth's history. Uh, as the climate starts to show evidence of changing from human behavior and as the population increases and the needs uh, associated with development are increasing day after day. Uh, this meeting is bringing together leading scholars from industry, from academia, from our campus, and from far away, and it's exciting to see us getting together and talking about these important issues. I, I, I do want to give special thanks to our visitors who have traveled here uh, from distant places. I, I know uh, Champaign-Urbana is not always the easiest place to get to from far away, uh, and we really appreciate your coming here to visit, and we hope that you'll take a chance uh, to walk around the campus and to get, us, get to know us a little bit better. I, I can assure you that the climate in and the weather in uh, uh, Champaign-Urbana is always exactly like this, um, <laughs> especially in January. Um, and, uh, and I also want to thank uh, the IC staff and leadership for putting together the meeting. I, I know that there's a lot of work that goes into this. Uh, today, what you guys will be talking about is examining one of the most pressing societal and environmental challenges uh, that we face, uh, how a growing population can have equitable access to energy and to development in ways that won't have terrible negative impacts on the climate and on other sectors of the population. Uh, all the different needs have to be balanced. Dr. Coonan uh, was indeed provocative last night, uh, but he did lay out some of the challenges, some of the balances that have to be made and the fact that values are going to be different among different people facing the same issues and presented with the same facts. Uh, even if they agree on the facts, they may approach them with different values. And we all know that not everybody in this world is going to agree on the facts in the same way. Uh, to address these complexities, we're going to need not just great science, but great engineering, great applications of the science, and great policy development and communication. And the challenges can really only be met through a combination of scientific advances, engineering advances, policy advance advances, changes in law, and through communication and understanding across people. Uh, I, I do want to talk a little bit about our host organization here that uh, Evan DeLucia runs for the university, uh, the Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment, uh, because that's the convening organization for this meeting, and uh, it really embodies what strengths the University of Illinois brings to this topic. Uh, just briefly to overview the Institute, it came out of a campus-wide consultation in 2012 and 2013 uh, and garnered support from all around the campus, truly folks in the humanities and the 
natural sciences, engineering, social sciences, everyone said we needed centralized, organized support for bringing together the tremendous strengths that we bring to the topics of energy and the environment and sustainability, uh, and some critical private support from the Baum Family Foundation. And the important questions that I see focuses on are society's most pressing issues related to those topics and what role the University of Illinois, as one of the premier universities in the world, can bring to solving these issues. Uh, the IC mission is to foster actionable, interdisciplinary research uh, that addresses the fundamental challenges in energy, the environment, and sustainability, and to provide national and international leadership in these areas that is commensurate with the strengths of one of the original land-grant institutions. This is highly interdisciplinary work, and I think the speaker list for this conference shows just how diverse the expertise that a great land-grant institution can bring together should be, and shows how important it is to bring in all the different academic specialties that have bearing on these important topics. Uh, you've seen the, uh, the slides going up. There is a new Energy at Illinois website. Uh, there, just on time, there it is. Uh, the Energy at Illinois website uh, that IC has launched that demonstrates the wonderful things going on on campus and the connections between all the different disciplines, something special that the University of Illinois brings to this. The possibilities that I see brings, that the University of Illinois brings, and that this gathering of people brings are, re bring, are really exciting. Uh, we have a chance here to make progress, to talk across disciplines, and to make sure that folks from chemistry to economics to law to engineering of all sorts of different stripes get to know what each other are doing in this important area, hopefully educate each other, develop new ideas, and build connections. This is the essence of what a land-grant university should be doing and what we do, I think, very well here at the University of Illinois, serving the needs of the people in the state of Illinois and across the nation in important and, I'd say, critical societal issues. I'm looking forward to hearing about the advances that come out of this session and the whole conference. I know that you guys will have great interactions uh, amongst yourselves. Uh, and we'll get to know a little bit about the University of Illinois and get to those of you who are from off campus uh, and the folks from on campus will get to make connections amongst yourselves and with people on the outside and we'll develop the science and hopefully lead to greater impact on the world. I uh, hope you have a great couple days. Thanks very much. Thank you, Peter, for those remarks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to session one. This one's entitled Low Carbon Energy, the Science, the Reality, and the Future. My name is Bruce Elliott Litchfield, and I'll help facilitate the session. And we're going to ask the three speakers for this session to come up and have a seat now, so make your way up to the table. Um, this session is about an hour and a half long. There'll be a coffee break at 10.15. So uh, each of the speakers intends to finish in time for you to ask a few questions, but we hope the conversation will continue to the break time, so uh, make sure and connect and engage uh, if you don't get your questions in or if you'd like to continue them during the break. Um, we have three distinguished speakers who will help set the uh, stage for further discussion about this topic. And the first is getting mic'd up, Sharon Hamas Schiffer. Sharon is uh, the Swanlin Professor of Chemistry here at the University of Illinois. She suggested that I keep her introduction short, so let me simply say that Sharon is a fellow of the American Physical Society, the American Chemical Society, the American Society for the Advancement of Science, and the Biophysical Society. Wow, she's really good. Uh, her title is, uh, of her talk is Solar Energy Through Better Chemistry. Uh, help me welcome Sharon to the podium. Okay, well, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here and tell you about some of the chemistry that we're doing to address the solar energy problem. And I'm going to start out with a video clip that I actually found uh, 
to be very interesting myself. See if you can recognize what this is from. I remember in college, another guy and I had an idea to... Mind if I talk about myself? If you don't, I will. Well, this guy and I had this idea. We... We wanted to find out what made the grass grow green. Now, that sounds silly and everything, but it's the biggest research problem in the world today, and I'll tell you why. Because there's a tiny little engine in the green of this grass and in the green of the trees that has the mysterious gift of being able to take energy from the rays of the sun and store it up. You see, that's how the heat and power in coal and oil and wood is stored up. Well, we thought if, if we could find the secret of all those millions of little engines in this green stuff, we could, we could make big ones. And then we could take all the power we could ever need right from the sun's rays, you see? Well, that's wonderful. I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. We worked on it and worked. And, you know, day and night, we got so excited we forgot to sleep. If, if we make just one little discovery, we'll walk on air for days. Yeah. school. Now he's selling automobiles. I'm in some strange thing called banking. Okay, that was uh, 1938, okay? Jimmy Stewart, right, apparently knew, or uh, in this movie he knew, that solar energy, in particular artificial photosynthesis, could be very important for society. But now, if we fast forward to 2015, if you look at this uh, pie chart, you can see that solar energy is, 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 is actually only 0.6% of the uh, US energy consumption. Renewable energy is 10% and solar is just 6% of that. So the question is, if they knew in 1938, you know, why, what, what's taking us so long to get there? So the challenge of renewable energy is to take fuels from abundant substrates, such as wind and solar, and uh, get renewable energy. And we can either go directly to electricity, go right to that light bulb, or we can convert it to chemical fuels in the form of chemical bonds. And going back and forth between renewable energy and the chemical fuels, that requires catalysts. And we want to be able to make these catalysts from earth-abundant metal complexes. So we want to use this part of the periodic table. So these electrocatalysts have to convert electrical energy to chemical energy in the form of chemical bonds. And one example is water splitting. We want to take water and split it into hydrogen and oxygen. And that requires actually two steps. One step where you split water into oxygen and then protons and electrons. And then another step where you take those protons and electrons and you combine them to make molecular hydrogen, H2. So what you see here is that the these sorts of chemical reactions, I'm going to turn that one off. Yeah. These sorts of chemical reactions involve all these protons and electrons. And so we need catalysts to control the multi proton, multi electron reactions. Now, I'm a theoretical chemist, and you might wonder what on earth does a theorist who just works with you know, pencil and paper and computers, what can we bring to the table of, for solar energy? But it turns out that designing these kinds of catalysts actually requires feedback between experiment and theory. And that's the most effective way to tackle this problem. So the experimental chemists are required to make the complexes. They need to make these, these molecules. And they also need to characterize them. They can characterize the structure using X-ray crystallography and NMR and infrared spectroscopy. And they can also perform cyclic voltammetry it, well, cyclic voltammetry, which is a CV, and that allows them to calculate reduction potentials. These are some CVs, and so each one of these peaks on these CVs, each one of them tells us what, what potential we can, we can add or remove an electron from the complex. 
The experimentalist can also calculate the pKa. That tells us how easy it is to add or remove a proton from these complexes. And theoretical chemists then can help interpret the experimental data and also to make some predictions that can then be tested experimentally. So we can actually calculate these reduction potentials, which can help then assign the peaks in the cyclic voltammogram. We can also calculate pKa's. In some cases, the experimentalists can't actually calculate certain pKa's. They can't isolate those intermediates, for example. And if we take those reduction potentials and those pKa's, then we can determine reaction pathways. And then we can make predictions as to how we can alter the pathways or the thermodynamics or the kinetics. And we can give those predictions to our experimental collaborators, who then, in turn, can test our predictions. And if we're wrong, we have to go back to the drawing board and modify our, our model or our theory. And if we're right, then we continue to design better catalysts. So there's really a feedback between experiment and theory. So the easiest reaction is actually making hydrogen, right? You just have to take protons and electrons and put them together. So that's the one that I'm going to talk about here. But a lot of the principles actually apply to other reactions. And we've studied other reactions as well. So the idea is you have these catalysts, these uh, sort of rose-colored circles that combine electrons from the electrode with protons from solution to generate hydrogen. And the goal is to design these catalysts to have a very high turnover frequency, so we want it to be fast, and a low overpotential. We, want, we don't want to have to put too much energy into the system. And we'd like to make them from environmentally friendly, cost-effective, and Earth-abundant materials. So these catalysts involve many different steps, often proton transfer, what we call PT, and electron transfer, ET, or concerted electron-proton transfer, EPT. And we care about both the thermodynamics, or the relative free energies of all these intermediates along the reaction pathway, as well as the kinetics, the barriers that connect these intermediates. So we want to figure out how can we modify these catalysts to change the mechanism, in other words, change the order of the steps the thermodynamics and the kinetics. So we've devised computational protocols where we can calculate the reduction potentials and the pKa's for each of the steps, each electron transfer and proton transfer along the pathway. And then we can generate free energy diagrams for any mechanism you can dream up. And then we can identify the thermodynamically favored pathway. So an example is this molecule shown here. It's a cobaloxime, and it's known to produce hydrogen from protic solutions at modest overpotentials. And we looked at many different pathways. You can see here that there's four different branches. All of these branches lead to hydrogen. They involve a cobalt hydride intermediate. This is cobalt-3 hydride, cobalt-2 hydride, different oxidation states of the cobalt. But they all lead to hydrogen. And so we were able to identify which was the favored pathway for each cobaloxime. But what we're really interested in is how can we tune the thermodynamics. So for example, these R groups on the cobaloxane, we can change them to different substituents. So we looked at a series of different substituents. I show all of them here. And we characterized them by their Hammett constant. And the Hammett constant it reflects the electron donating and withdrawing characteristics of this substituent. So for example, if these substituents are electron withdrawing, so if they take electrons away, then it's easier to add an electron to the metal. And it, it's harder to actually add a proton. So it, of course, it affects all of the thermodynamics depending on the electronic characteristics of that substituent. So what we did is we plotted all of the different reduction potentials and pKa's that, that were relevant to the system as a function of the Hammett constant. And what we found is that all of these quantities are linearly correlated with this Hammett constant. And this is very important for our experimental collaborators who want to design better catalysts, because this tells us that if they know the Hammett constant of a substituent, and these are all tabulated in the literature, then they can know all of the different reduction potentials and pKa's for this molecule. And then they can generate the free energy diagram and figure out the thermodynamically optimal pathway. And so we're able to predict catalysts that follow different pathways, and we're able to find design catalysts that have a lower overpotential and, for example, require weaker acids. Right? We'd rather have our solar cell not have some really strong acid that if it starts leaking, you know, bad things would happen. And we can not only modify these substituents, these R groups, but we can also modify the ligands themselves. For example, in these cobaloxemes, there's this BF2 bridge between the two oxygens. We can change that BF2 to a hydrogen, as we see here. 
And then what happens is when you have a hydrogen there, this ligand can become protonated. So another proton can come on. And that's called ligand non-innocence. You can think of these, these ligands as being sort of guilty ligands. Okay? They're participating in the catalysis. They're helping to shuttle protons around in addition to shuttling electrons around. Now, another example of ligand non-innocence and an example of how theory can help design better catalysts is these hangman metalloporphyrins that were studied by Dan Nocera's group. Dan is at Harvard now. And what they, these, these uh, hangman metalloporphyrins, they can have either a cobalt or a nickel in the center, and then they have this ring around them. And th what's important about these is they have a carboxylic acid group hanging. That's why it's called a hangman porphyrin. So it's hanging over the metal. And originally they thought, well, what, the reason these work so well, they generate hydrogen so well, is that this hanging proton is transferred to the metal, and that forms a metal hydride. And that's where you get hydrogen. So that makes everything faster. But our calculations show that, in fact, the mechanism is, is different from what they thought originally. Our calculations show that this proton doesn't go to the metal. It actually goes to this carbon on the porphyrin ring. And the reason it can do this is that the second electron, the second step, basically reduction, ends up going on to the porphyrin itself instead of on the metal. And these porphyrins are aromatic. Aromaticity actually stabilizes these molecules. But once you add an extra electron, you break that aromaticity. And suddenly, it's not stable. And it actually wants to take a proton. So it forms what we call a fluorine intermediate. And this was actually a, a very unusual mechanism. And it's another example of ligand non-innocence, because this porphyrin takes both an electron and a proton. And I'll say when we first proposed it, there was a lot of skepticism, right? The experimentalists are often a little bit skeptical of theorists, and they said these crazy theorists, right? They're just coming up with these un completely unreasonable mechanisms. It doesn't make any sense, OK? So, but uh, we were undeterred, and we, we, we generated an entire reaction pathway. I'm not going to go through it, but this is, turns out it's thermodynamically downhill once you form that fluorine intermediate. And you never actually form a metal hydride. Everything goes through the ring onto the carbons. And that's actually very important, because that means you can make these catalysts without metal, which is, of course, cheaper and also much more environmentally friendly. But there was this, this skepticism until I gave a talk then in Boston about a year ago. And one of the graduate students in Dan Nocera's group said, hey, I bet I can isolate that intermediate, that fluorine intermediate you think is there, but nobody believes. And he said, I think I can do that by taking a weak acid, a phenol, and trapping it. So it can go to the fluorine part, but it can't go all the way to hydrogen. And he did indeed do that. The fluorine was, in fact, detected experimentally. This little peak here from spectroelectrochemistry shows the fluorine. He did a CV. This little peak here is exactly where we predicted it would be for the fluorine. We actually simulated the cyclic voltammograms for two different systems with three different acids. And we were, everything, everything matches up just right. So now I think we've convinced the field that, in fact, there are, there are these fluorine intermediates. And you can, in fact, bypass the metal altogether and actually generate hydrogen from a free base porphyrin with no metal. So we've shown how we can alter the mechanism, the thermodynamics and the kinetics by modifying the substituents, the ligands, or the metal center. And often we think of these in terms of sequential reactions. You have PT followed by ET or ET followed by PT. But in many cases, you actually want to favor a concerted mechanism because you can see that the concerted mechanism, what we call EPT, that avoids these high energy intermediates, so it will require a lower overpotential, which you remember was one of our objectives. So this is actually something near and dear to my heart, because way back when I was an assistant professor at Notre Dame, we actually developed, well, we started developing a general theory for what's called proton coupled electron transfer, or PCET. And at the time, I was a very much of a theorist theorist. I was not connected to, to you know, experiments or even reality, really, at all. So, um, I just loved it. I thought it was cool, right? And I thought it was neat. And there's nobody. It was sort of an open playing field, pretty much of an empty field, I'd say, at the time. So I could just do what I wanted and, uh, and do theory. So it was really fun. And then about uh, maybe six, eight years later, suddenly when all the money and funding and interest started going into solar and other, other sorts of these uh, energy conversion processes, people realize that this PCET is at the heart of all of them. And understanding PCET is absolutely essential. So this is actually an example of how fundamental research that has no applications whatsoever when it starts can become actually extremely applied later on that you don't know ahead of time. 
And so that's, I think, a, certainly a, a push for funding uh, fundamental research. So in this theory, we have an electron and a proton transferring. And we have, actually, we can describe it in terms of four states, the initial state, and then the state where both the electron and the proton transferred, and then a state where only the proton transferred, and a state where only the electron transferred. So we can actually describe sequential reactions by going along the outside of this rectangle, PT followed by ET, or ET followed by PT. And we can describe the concerted mechanism by going along the diagonal, just go along this, this EPT diagonal. And the mechanism will be determined by the relative energies of these states and the couplings between them. And when these off-diagonal states are much higher in energy, you're going to follow the diagonal to avoid those high energy intermediates. So we actually derived analytical expressions for the PCET rate constants in various well-defined regimes and applied them to solution and enzyme systems. So those are, we, we, did, we did a lot of that. But when the, when the solar energy push came from DOE and NSF, actually, all, all together, then we realized you know, electrochemistry is this open area for PCET. So we derived expressions for electrochemical rate constants, where you have a molecule in solution, and the electron goes from the molecule to the electrode, and you have proton transfer within the molecule. And then we, we derived expressions for the uh, rate constants and the current densities and uh, applied them to a whole series of different electrochemical systems. And here's an example of an electrochemical system that we studied. And what's interesting about this system is that actually it's inspired from biology. So it turns out that biology already knows how to do this. Nature has already done this in terms of producing and oxidizing uh, hydrogen because uh, it has hydrogenase enzymes that do this already. So for example, this is a nickel iron hydrogenase, and there's an iron iron hydrogenase. These exist naturally. And so there's a whole community that's working to design catalysts to mimic these hydrogenase active sites. So I give two examples of these catalysts, a nickel iron one and an iron iron one. And these are actually structurally biomimetic. They're trying to really mimic the structure of the active site. And we've worked with my colleague Tom Rauchfuss here at the University of Illinois, where, where we've looked at some of these systems. He, he was making them, and I showed up four years ago. And then we found this uh, natural uh, connection where we were able to, uh, to work with him. But I'm also interested in what's called functionally biomimetic. So they don't necessarily have the same structure, but they do the same function. And now we have only one nickel center, because it's easier to make one nickel center than, than two. Right? Two metal centers are always harder. And this is part of an EFRC, an Energy Frontier Research Center. Uh, it's the Center for Molecular Electrocatalysis, funded by DOE. It's, it's centered at PNNL. But there are outside people, such as myself, that are also involved in it. And Dan Dubois, who started this center, he designed these nickel catalysts with pendant amines. And they have very high turnover frequencies. For a while, they were the fastest, I think, catalysts for producing hydrogen. It's always dangerous to say that these days, because you know, last week a paper could have come out with a faster one. But I'll just say they're very fast. And unfortunately, though, they do require a, a, a fairly, uh, I'd say, modest over potential, but not as low as one would want. And so the idea is, can we help them design these sorts of catalysts with a lower over potential. And these catalysts actually can either produce or oxidize hydrogen, depending on the substituents. And some of them are even reversible. You can go both directions. We've been focusing mainly on hydrogen production. And what's interesting about these, these uh, catalysts is they were designed these dependent amines. These are nitrogen groups hanging over the metal. It turns out they're very important for shuttling protons to and from the solution and to and from the metal. And so if you look down here, it's called a proton relay, where you can protonate this nitrogen, which then can pass the proton along to this nickel, forming a nickel hydride. And then if you protonate that nitrogen again, and again, you see these two hydrogens are positioned just right to form a bond and go off as hydrogen. So they're using this design, this design of this catalyst, to put these, position these hydrogens close enough to generate molecular hydrogen. And it turns out that. Uh, one of these steps actually involves proton coupled electron transfer, or PCET. So when you have the nitrogen and the nickel transferring the proton, and then the electron is transferring between the molecule and the electrode. So we wanted to enhance the concerted PCET mechanism in order to lower the overpotential for this step. And so this is the molecule. Here's the nickel, and here's the nitrogen. And it turns out the average nickel nitrogen distance is 3.25 angstroms, and that's too long for the proton to transfer, it will never go at that distance. But lucky for us, these things work at room temperature, and they're not frozen. Molecules are always moving. They're always fluctuating. They're just normal thermal fluctuations. And you can see one right here that's pulling the nitrogen toward the nickel. 
And so these thermal fluctuations are required for proton transfer. So our calculations resulted in a guiding design principle. This guiding design principle is that the pendant amine should be flexible enough to allow this motion you can see toward the nickel center, but still reasonably well positioned. So what we wanted to do is design these catalysts with more flexible ligands. So that's actually a different design principle than the original one that they had. So originally, the design principle was, let's hold this nit nitrogen as rigidly as possible over the metal center. That's what they thought would be the best thing. And what we said is, well, yes, you need to have it close by, but you also need to build in some flexibility because it's not going to be close enough, and you need these fluctuations in order for this reaction to occur efficiently. So we, for example, designed this other molecule, which is very flexible. This arm can go back and forth. In fact, it's too flexible. Then it stays too far away from the metal center. And we told our collaborators, well, try building this molecule. Well, they tried to synthesize it, but the metal fell out. So this is a lesson learned for the theorists that we shouldn't really be telling our experimental collaborators what molecules to make. They're synthetic chemists. They know better than I do. I can make anything on the computer, right? But they can't necessarily do it in the lab. And so the idea is instead of telling them specific molecules, we should tell them some guiding design principles that they can then use to build the molecules they think make sense. Okay, so that's really how we work. We gave them this design principle, which is they need to have this flexibility, but they also need to have it reasonably well positioned. So they need to find that sweet spot. And then we let them do their job, what they're good at. And they actually were able to make some very promising catalysts. These are, this is the group at PNNL, National Lab. And they were able, so this design principle has, in fact, been borne out. So back to, to, uh, to that uh, video clip we saw at the beginning, Jimmy Stewart, who's talking about photosynthesis. Well, that's another inspiration for all of us in terms of solar energy, right? Because in photosynthesis, they use light to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And here's an example of photosynthesis. You see protons and electrons going all different places in different directions. And actually, PS2, that's photosystem 2, this green blob, that's actually where the water is split. And so one of our other efforts is to use, to basically look at PCET in photosystem 2. And what you see here is that we have electron transfer through the protein, through a very complicated route. But there's also proton transport through the protein as well. And these are just actually guesses. They don't really know that this is how the electron and proton are going. They're reasonable guesses based on experimental data. So the idea is, can we use Photosystem 2 as an inspiration to design, for example, artificial photosynthetic systems? And for this, we're working with Tom and Anna Moore at Arizona, again, experimental collaborators. And they've been working many years on this. We just got on a board maybe about a year ago. So they've been designing mimics of Photosystem 2. And our calculations have been helping to guide the design of these kinds of artificial photosynthetic systems. So we've been looking at many different types of molecules. So their system is shown up here in the box. But then below, you see three different molecules that we've looked at. The one is very bulky. And so that's kind of awkward to make. And what they really want to do is they want to be able to transport protons as well as the electrons. You saw they all involve proton as well as electron transfer. So the idea is they don't want a single proton transfer. They want a relay. They want a whole series of proton transfers that are happening at the same time. And so what they did is they said, let's build this middle molecule here. And they said, if we build this middle molecule, maybe both protons will go. This proton here will definitely go, and the other proton will go also. In fact, when they gave us this molecule, they thought it was going. There were two proton transfers. My student, Moi Huin, looked at this, did some calculations, and said, there's no way the second proton's going. It's thermodynamically very unfavorable. That's not happening. But if you want the second proton to go, why don't you build this molecule over here, the one on the far, uh, far uh, right there? And then you'll have both protons go. And at the same time, the oxidation potential will go down to 0.62. That's what my student uh, predicted. And indeed, they made this molecule, and the oxidation potential went exactly where he said it would. And they realized that, they, that he was right when they did the IR spectrum on this. It wasn't, the second proton wasn't going. So again, this is an example of how theory was helping them. But then they said, but we don't want the oxidation potential to go down to 0.6. It has to stay at 1 volt to fit in with the rest of the system. So now we actually have another molecule. We would both protons going and an oxidation potential of one volt. And that's perfect to fit into their artificial photosynthetic system. And that's actually, that work is being written up right now. So again, we're inspired by biology, but we also need that feedback between theory and experiment to get these things exactly where we want them. So to summarize, the effective use of solar energy requires the design of catalysts. 
And these catalysts need to control the movement of electrons and protons. And biology can inspire us. Hydrogenases and photosynthesis are two examples. And the combination of theory and experiment is going to be essential to solving this problem. And theory can provide these catalyst design principles that can help our experimental collaborators design more effective catalysts. For example, they can alter the substituents, the ligands, and the uh, metal to change the mechanism, the thermodynamics, and the kinetics. They can also explore implications of ligand non-innocence. We can take advantage of the ligands taking protons and electrons and passing them around. And also, we can uh, facilitate the concerted mechanism to lower the overpotential by decreasing the proton donor acceptor distance and enhancing flexibility, which wasn't really considered before we started doing these kinds of calculations. So I want to end by acknowledging my group. None of this would have been possible without the hard work of, of all of these people and also our experimental collaborators, and we wouldn't have known what to actually calculate without their help. And uh, the funding was, NSF has always funded the, the theory development, so the fundamental theory. But then DOE, I'm in part of two of these EFRCs, actually one centered at PNNL and one at uh, Northwestern. And also NSF, this, uh, this center, uh, CCI, is at, uh, centered at Caltech, led by Harry Gray. So all three of these centers has, have put us in contact with experimentalists who have uh, really been able to inspire us with, with their work. And also, ex also experimentalists outside of these centers have also helped us. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, time for maybe a question or two. Evan. Sharon, in um, that great movie clip, the little engine is, of course, the chloroplast. And in oxygen evolving complex in photosystem two, um, that chemistry is enormously facilitated by a very intricate spatial arrangement of things. And my impression of what you've described today is this is a bunch of stuff happening in solution. Is there, is there a benefit to the spatial arrangement in artificial systems, and is there a theory for that? Yeah, I mean, so molecules are much easier to make, right, than the, the, the complex proteins. The other option is to use proteins, right, in, in solar cells. The problem is that they're not very robust. You need your solar cell to keep doing it over and over again. And, and, and when we take them, obviously, they're robust in a plant. But, but when we start putting them in our solar cells, they, 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 they don't survive as, as well. As in molecules are going to be more hardy. We can tune them better. So yeah, the, 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 you're right. I mean, the photosynthesis, you know, they have everything just perfectly arranged. And the idea is, can we just take the pieces of that that are absolutely necessary for our purposes and harness that? So you know, it, there's, there are different directions one could go. But uh, this happens to the molecular side. There are people trying to take you know, actual like cytochrome C or some of these other proteins, attach them to surfaces, and actually use them directly. I don't know that that, I don't think that has really the long-term uh, possibilities that the molecules do in terms of it's just easier to synthesize the molecules, easier to tune them for our purposes. OK, great. Very interesting. Thanks, Sharon. Thank Sharon again for uh, getting it started. So our next speaker is uh, Kenneth Christensen, professor and College of Engineering Collegiate Chair in Fluid Mechanics at the University of Notre Dame. Notice we seem to have some sort of U of I Notre Dame exchange going on here because Ken used to be here at the U of I and still comes back, he tells me, about once a month. So thanks for coming back, Ken, to join us. Uh, uh, he directs a group that pursues experimental studies of turbulence, geophysical flows, and microfluidics. He also is a fellow of APS and also the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. And notably for this talk, he's principal investigator in the Carbon Dioxide Storage Division of the International Institute for Carbon Neutral Energy Research, ICERN. And Ken's talk is entitled, ICERN, Powering the Future, Internationalizing Research. Join me in welcoming Ken to the podium. get us back to the beginning here. Okay. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be, be, at, uh, be back. Um, I am giving this talk on behalf of Professor Petrus Sofronis, 
who's a faculty member here in the Department of Mechanical Science and Engineering. Uh, he is organizing and running a conference right now on hydrogen in the Grand Tetons, and so he was not able to be here, and so he asked me to give uh, this talk in his place. Um, I've been involved with this uh, research center, the International Institute for Carbon Neutral Energy Research, which we term Eisner, uh, for about five years now. And I'd like to describe uh, the structure of this institute. It's sort of unique in the sense that it brings together an international flavor to tackle a very important, obviously very important problem related to carbon neutrality. Um, and I'd like to discuss some of the um, unique uh, work that can be done by leveraging these sorts of international uh, interactions. Okay, so let me describe uh, how Eisner is funded. Um, it is what is called the World Premier International Research Center. Um, this is a program in Japan that has been around for roughly 10 years now. Um, it is jointly funded by the Japan Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology, termed MEXT, uh, and the Japan so Society for the Promotion of Science. Okay? The objectives of the center include establishing an international research environment within Japan to tackle essentially grand challenge sorts of issues. All right. um, I invite the best scientists from around the world within a host institution. In this case, uh, Eisner is hosted at Kyushu University, which is in Fukuoka in southwestern part of Japan. Um, each of these uh, institutes has 20 or more formal PIs, but roughly 150 uh, researchers total. That includes uh, uh, faculty, uh, assistant associate, full professors, postdocs, and students. Uh, the funding is vast, and so each of the centers is funded at 10 to 16 million dollars a year for 10 years with the potential of another five-year extension. The idea here is to cultivate these research centers at these universities, build them up to the point where they are essentially self-sustaining for them to exist for as long as their topic of uh, focal topic uh, is of interest uh, and concern to society. Um, the idea here really is to advance cutting edge interdisciplinary research, which the Japanese term fusion. Okay. Um, clearly the topics that are being discussed today are inherently interdisciplinary, and so this center itself is as well. An interesting aspect of this, um, this WPI program is reformation of the university system in Japan. The idea is to uh, promote a more American system where assistant and associate professors will have much more autonomy in their own research programs than they currently have in, in Japan where full professors essentially run very large groups within which the junior faculty sit. Okay. Um, the interesting part of Eisner is that its director is uh, from the United States. It is uh, one of uh, roughly 10 centers that exist right now, for which Petros is the only international director. The reason that he was, he was uh, chosen in that regard was both because he helped lead the proposal effort for this uh, uh, initiative, but also because they really wanted to focus on this issue of reforming the Japanese academic system. And by bringing in a foreign director, they felt that this would uh, perhaps uh, provide some momentum in that regard. So these are the, the current WPI institutes. They cross a number of, of, of topics from origins of the universe, uh, earth and life, materials and energy under which uh, Eisner sits, and the life sciences. Okay. Um, this is a large institute at Kyushu University. In fact, two new buildings have been built to house the research and interests of Eisner. Um, you can see both of them shown here. Uh, I will tell you, watching buildings go up on US academic campuses, both here and at Notre Dame, and watching this build, these buildings go up at Kyushu University, the Japanese are much more efficient in this regard. Each of these buildings went from ground up in 18 months. Um, they house a number of very sophisticated uh, scientific laboratories across disciplines. Um, and the idea is that they promote this interdisciplinary culture that's central to the research of the Institute. Okay, so here's Eisner's mission statement. Um, is to contribute to the creation of a sustainable, environmentally friendly society by conducting fundamental research 
for both the advancement of low carbon emission and cost effective energy system and improvement of energy efficiency, primarily hydrogen as a fuel, as well as advancing CO2 capture and storage technology or its conversion to a useful product. So the notion that establishing a carbon neutral energy uh, system in Japan in this case will be a long-term goal, 50 plus years, we have to deal with the interim issues of, of continual use of fossil fuels and thus uh, uh, a, a primary, one of the primary pillars of research in Eisner is really CO2 capture and storage and that's where my involvement comes in from a research perspective. Okay? And again, the four pillars of this WPI uh, program is cutting edge research, creation of new knowledge by fusion of disciplines, internationally visible research environment, and reformation of, in this case, the Japanese research systems. So this is a very busy plot. It highlights the uh, research pillars uh, of the institute. And you can see a range of things. Uh, much of it is focused on hydrogen from a number of perspectives. Okay, so catalytic materials transformations, um, hydrogen storage, uh, molecular photoconversion devices, electrochemical energy conversion, hydrogen materials compatibility. Those focal areas go from um, hydrogen production, transport, storage, and usage. Okay, and so all of these pathways from the creation of the fuel to the use of the fuel are covered in uh, the Institute's uh, primary research areas. Along with that uh, is a CO2 capture and utilization uh, division, okay, and also the CO2 storage division, uh, which I am a part of. You can see clearly linkages across all of these research areas. I'd also like to point out an interesting aspect of the Institute is what we call the Energy Analysis Division. This division essentially looks at the uh, economic aspects of the technologies that are being proposed within the Institute in all of these divisions. Okay? And so it essentially guides the realistic uh, pursuit of the science. Okay? So we do fundamental science, but we do it with a purpose, and that is we would like to see it translate right, to uh, eventual usage. And the Energy Analysis Division essentially provides each of the researchers with a bit of dose of reality of what may be economically feasible either now or in the future. Okay. And so it provides an umbrella structure over all of the scientific aspects of the, of the institute. Um, we have a broad network of excellence. So uh, Petros likes to say we're everywhere across the world. Uh, he's uh, right in spirit. A uh, number of collaborators in the United States, uh, many in Europe and Asia, and many of these collaborations are informal and some are formalized. Uh, so there is funding from the Japanese side that is passed to international collaborators. Particularly here at the University of Illinois, there's what's called the Eisner Satellite Center. It involves eight or nine uh, Illinois faculty members another 10 to 12 graduate students that are formally funded from the money that is given to Eisner uh, from uh, MEXT and also JSPS, okay? So this is, this is an interesting funding structure where typically that's very difficult to do. Uh, so we've broken a barrier to allow money to actually pass uh, to the U.S. from Japan uh, and promote very strong collaborations between Illinois faculty members and uh, those at Kyushu University that are associated with Eisner. Another thing that this institute uh, provides an umbrella structure for is student exchange. So undergraduates have now come from Kyushu to the University of Illinois, I believe now three times. Uh, we now have an MOU agreement between Kyushu and Illinois to provide a framework for this undergraduate exchange. Okay. Um, and so this is an opportunity again to provide some uh, uh, ability to reform the Japanese academic system even at the undergraduate level. Okay, so I'd like to just highlight a couple of the focus areas of the Institute, ones that I am probably not, uh, have enough expertise to discuss, but I will do so anyway. And then at the end, I will just highlight for a few minutes my particular work in this Institute. 
uh, Professor Hamas Schiffer talked about um, hydrogenase enzymes and um, discovery of these enzymes to build new catalysts for uh, hydrogen production and water splitting. Uh, she also mentioned Tom Rashfus, who's a member of uh, Eisner Satellite Center here at the University of Illinois. And he works with Professor Ogo at Kyushu University, who discovers these enzymes in nature. And Professor Rashfus's group uh, um, essentially replicates them in the laboratory. Okay. Um, fuel cells are a big deal uh, uh, in the institute. And for example, this work is the development of a new class of efficient and durable uh, uh, polymer electrolyte fuel cells. Okay, so the notion of high temperature durability is really important for uh, long-term use of, of these sorts of fuel cells. And so work in Eisner has been focused on really improving uh, the durability of, of these PEFCs uh, at high temperatures. Um, here is a particular topic that's related to more interim um, translation from a fossil fuel-based energy system to a carbon neutral one, and then has to do with carbon dioxide capture uh, and uh, storage. So this particular division involves uh, a, a faculty member at Kyushu and Professor Paul Kennis here at the University of Illinois. The focus of, of the CO2 capture division is really a twofold. One is, is more efficient capture uh, through development of new nanometer thick membranes uh, that have high gas uh, flux. And also the development of uh, electrochemical reactor systems that allow the CO2 to be converted to some sort of other useful fuel. So there are two pathways once the CO2 is captured. One is storage, which I'll discuss in a moment. The other pathway is to actually convert it to a useful fuel in some other aspect, okay? And so uh, Paul's group has been working on this uh, um, quite a bit. From a storage perspective, this is where my own um, uh, research interests and expertise uh, sits. Once the CO2 is captured, one option for uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions is to store it in the geology of, of the Earth. And so, um, you know, the idea is to capture, perhaps at the source, to inject it deep within the geosphere in a rock structure that is favorable for maintaining, uh, um, for essentially immobilizing the CO2 so that it cannot migrate and be re-released to the atmosphere. These wells where the CO2 is injected are tens of kilometers in size, all right? And so the CO2 is injected typically in a liquid or supercritical uh, state because of the thermodynamic conditions, high pressure, high temperature, uh, uh, at, you know, 3,000 meters in the geosphere. Okay? It propagates through the well. That's on the, the macro scale. On the micro scale, this, this um, CO2 is displacing the water that re already resides within the rock. And so from one pore space to the next, the CO2 is pushing the water out, and the CO2 is now occupying uh, that pore structure. So really, the mobility of the CO2 occurs on the micron scale, while its large-scale fate really occurs on the kilometer scale. So you're dealing with a range of scales here on the order of 10 to the 10. Right? We rely on simulations to tell us where the CO2 is going. We can't simulate the airflow over an airplane. This one's even harder because it's multi-phase, okay? So at the reservoir scale, I said really the goal is to predict where the CO2 will end up. This includes both for pre-site uh, evaluation. You wanna make sure that you're choosing the correct site, right? Is the geology appropriate? But then post-injection, you wanna be able to track it and you want efficacy in that tracking. Meter scale physics is typically captured in these numerical simulations. I just talked about how micron scale physics is important. So we have a disconnect, right? So we really have to have a subgrid scale model that captures this sort of thing to uh, improve the accuracy of reservoir scale simulations. CO2 trapping at this scale is governed by a balance of viscous capillary, depending on the conditions, buoyancy, and inertial effects. So it's a complex force balance that will determine whether the CO2 continues to move or whether it will remain trapped. The goal is for it to be trapped. If it's trapped, it will eventually dissolve into the water. 
or it will eventually react with the resident rock and form a carbonate. The carbonate's great because it becomes rock. Okay. Then it's essentially permanently trapped in the geosphere. Um, State-of-the-art poor scale models don't capture this physics, and so the goal of our work is to do experiments that validate simulations and provide uh, a framework for uh, model development that can improve reservoir scale simulations, okay? So flow at the pore scale. It really defines the CO2 mobility. The trouble is with the CO2 that's coming in is less viscous than the water. When that happens, you get an inherent instability at the interface. So if you think of the black here as CO2, the white as water, and this is some sort of porous rock structure, you get what's called fingering. So you don't get this uniform propagation of a CO2 front, rather you get this preferential pathways that form. Why is this troublesome? Well, you have a pore structure. You'd like to fill that volume. You'd like to maximize the volume of that pore structure you fill with CO2. Clearly, we're not doing that because of this inherent instability of the fluid system. Okay? On the top is what's called viscous fingering. This is where viscosity dominates, and you essentially just get this push through of the CO2 along a few dominant paths. Okay? On the bottom is what's called capillary fingering. In this case, instead of the pressure gradient from the injection side downward being the driving force to push the CO2, it's actually the pressure gradient across each of the pores throats that determines whether the CO2 will move or sit. What happens in that case is you get much better coverage. So from a CO2 storage efficiency standpoint, we'd like to be operating in this regime. We don't understand how to control that sort of process or model that sort of process at this point. Okay. So we've developed some uh, measurement systems that allow us to do this experimentally and to study this physics. So here's a movie um, of a heterogeneous pore structure. This is essentially etched in a micromodel, okay? And what we're doing here is the green, this should replay itself, the green is water, and so it's essentially tagged so we can track its motion. And then you'll see here a, a supercritical CO2 front come and then eventually break through. So this is the fingering that you saw in the previous uh, slide, okay? And what you notice is that it breaks through in a very sort of random ad hoc way. Once it breaks through, there's still green left, which means there's still water trapped in the pore structure. This is the, the inefficient trapping of the CO2 because we can't, uh, we can't propagate it through as a uniform front. The other thing I'd like to point out is the issue of time scales here. Um, as the CO2 front comes, once this starts once again, there we go, you'll see that the CO2 breaks through very quickly at very high speeds. Okay, so it's just a couple of frames. When that happens, viscous forces are no longer dominant. Actually, inertial forces become really important. From a fluid mechanics point of view, the problem goes from being linear to nonlinear. Okay, from a simulation perspective, you've now really hurt yourself because you have to consider the nonlinearities of this flow. What do we do with this data? Well, from tracking the water particles, we can get the instantaneous water velocity field. So we can essentially quantify how fast is the water moving, which implies how fast is the CO2 moving. Okay? So here you see pre-front, the water essentially flows preferentially through this heterogeneous rock structure. Once you get breakthrough, you see very high velocities forming. And as that CO2 front moves through, you get velocities that are on the order, in this case, of five millimeters per second. Okay, that's uh, 10 times larger than the velocity that you would get if this just moved at a uniform pace. Okay. This implies inertial effects are important, nonlinear effects are important. We need to revise our models. Okay. The other thing that we do in the Institute is we look at optimizing the, the thermodynamic conditions so that we get maximum storage efficiency within the reservoir. Okay. So that's essentially what's represented here by the colors. Blue is poor storage efficiency, red is very high efficiency. And this occurs when things are really driven by capillary effects. So sort of the pressure gradient at the pore drives the propagation of the CO2 rather than the bulk uh, pressure gradient of the injection. Okay. 
We do this through numerical simulation using lattice Boltzmann methods. Um, this is a GPU-based uh, simulation approach, which uh, vastly reduces the computational time of these sorts of simulations. Right now, we're able to do rock, 3D heterogeneous rock simulations on the order of just shy of a centimeter on each side, okay, which is actually quite good for this sort of numerical simulation. So let me highlight two other things, and then I will uh, we'll stop. One of the other benefits of this sort of center structure is that it, it, it provides a framework for pursuing other international collaborative funding. So here at the University of Illinois, Eisner led a, a Pyre proposal okay, uh, with Kyushu University using the Eisner collaborative framework as the basis of this proposal. So if you're not familiar with, with Pyre, it's an NSF program. The idea is to promote international research and education. Okay. So promote graduate student exchange, promote collaborative research that involves graduate students on both sides. Okay. And so it's really a framework to promote exactly what Eisner is already doing. And so this was a perfect opportunity for Eisner uh, to uh, build its funding, funding portfolio. In this case, it was an integrated computational materials engineering for active materials and interfaces and chemical fuel production. It involved computations here at the University of Illinois, leveraging uh, uh, NCSA Blue Waters, and experimental uh, facilities at Kyushu that are, are world-class uh, facilities. Okay. The funding is, is quite good, so it's almost a million dollars a year from NSF, and there is uh, matching funds from JSPS on the Japanese side. So to conclude, um, I think uh, Eisner is very unique uh, in its uh, uh, mission and its approach. And so really, we've, we've realized a world-class institute. Um, it's building an impactful presence at the Kyushu University campus, particularly for academic reformation of the Japanese uh, academic system. Okay. The great part about this is that it's also fostered close connection and interaction with the University of Illinois. And so it's really been a, a founding linkage between these two uh, uh, very uh, talented research universities, one in Japan, one here in the United States. Okay? So uh, I'll leave you with the fact that I, I view Eisner as a test bed, okay? um, particularly from the perspective of internationalizing scientific research. The challenges that we're facing right now from an energy perspective are truly international. We need international collaboration, agreement, and solutions and we need to leverage the expertise that exists around the globe. And I think Eisner is at least providing a, a um, positive framework for realizing that goal. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Pardon if this is too simple-minded, but these pores have water in them. Yes. You want to get CO2 in them. Yes. Where does the water go? Dare I say the word Oklahoma? <laughs> the water propagates, usually these are sailing aquifers, so the water will propagate um, essentially downstream. The volume that you're looking at here is actually rather small. There are issues of microseismicity, which is what you're pointing to. Um, and for the Japanese, this is really important, right, because they are already in a active seismic environment. In Japan, I think the way that this will go is there will be small-scale CO2 storage wells at the source, much smaller than the ones that are envisioned here in the United States, much smaller than the ones that are already implemented in Europe. Norway is, is leading in this regard. Um, this is an issue, uh, but it's also an issue that is, is uh, um, is, is well studied, particularly on the Japanese side, uh, but it certainly is, is uh, an important issue to consider. I just wanted to follow up on that question. So, I mean, you say rather small, okay, but we're talking about a lot of carbon dioxide. So, I mean, if I have a, I don't know, a gigawatt power plant, um, how, you know, how many years can I imagine storing carbon dioxide in that well before it becomes, in some sense, full? Or is yes. it just an infinite source? I mean, an infinite no, uh, sink, I mean. It's certainly not infinite, right? I think the targets, 
particularly on the Japanese side, are on the 10 to 15 year time frame uh, at most. Um, it really depends on the well characteristics. Um, they're also looking at offshore storage, so within, within the rock below the, within the seabed. Um, but uh, certainly the storage is, is rather limited in that perspective. So the way that this is viewed in Japan anyway is as a truly transitional process uh, with the hope that hydrogen comes online as a, I wouldn't say as a majority, majority energy source, but as a, um, as a very important energy source in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years while ramping up the storage. And at that point, then the storage would ramp back down when reliance on particularly natural gas in Japan would decline. The challenge here is that Eisner's mission was formed right before Fukushima. And so nuclear was an important aspect of the Japanese energy portfolio. Um, that is still you know, a possibility. Jim Stubbins would know better than I would. Um, but um, you know, it's a collective approach. And certainly the notion of, of, of having limited storage capacity, particularly in Japan on island, is a very sensitive issue. In this kind of a consortium arrangement, when, I'll not say if, but when you have these discoveries that move things forward, what are the arrangements for essentially handling the intellectual property? Who, who decides what's going to get developed into something for pilot plants and ultimately commercialization? And how widely diffused can these technologies become after they're found? Yep. So uh, that's an excellent question. And so there were. I would guess about two years into this institute, um, year-long discussion between um, the IP folks here and those at Kyushu. And there is an agreement in place of uh, shared ownership uh, between the two universities um, and a plan in place for how uh, those technologies will uh, proliferate. There are. In my understanding, no uh, restrictions on where that might occur. It could be in Japan, it could be in the US, it could be elsewhere. Uh, but certainly there is a structure in place on how the um, uh, uh, ownership of, of those discoveries uh, will be split between the two universities. But it's certainly a big issue, right? Because we're looking really here at fundamental science translating to some sort of technological impact. And IP is, sits right in the middle of that. So our third speaker for this uh, session is Kenneth Gillingham, Assistant Professor of Economics at Yale. And he holds appointments in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, uh, Department of Economics and the School of Management, as well as a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Ken is just off a, a year at, as a senior economist, economist for energy and the environment, the White House Council of Economic Advisors. He is an energy and environmental economist drawing from the fields of applied microeconomics, behavioral economics, and industrial organization. And Kin's talk is entitled, Using Behavioral Economics for the Diffusion of Low Carbon Energy. Let's welcome Ken. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I'm actually going to give a bit of a broader talk than that. Um, I am going to follow the charge questions about low carbon energy, only I'm not going to talk about the science. I'm going to focus on the reality in the future. Uh, that's where economists come in, at least with the reality side, where no one can tell the future, of course. So I have uh, four main points about the reality in the future. And I'm really focusing here on low carbon electricity, not low carbon energy, because low carbon energy is so broad that you could bring in low carbon transportation fuels, low carbon, uh, a variety of, of other areas as well. You could bring in energy efficiency under that. So I'm going to focus on low carbon electricity here. And, and in particular, I'm going to focus on low carbon electricity. Let me move that down a little bit. Low carbon electricity uh, from renewables 
although not uh, saying anything about CCS. CCS is a little more costly, and much of the focus has really been on low carbon electricity from renewables. So that's where I'm going to focus. And there are several points that I want to make here. One is there's been unprecedented investment in the past five years in renewables, and that this can be expected to continue. This is both at the early stage R&D level, at the venture capital level, and at the final deployment level. I'll talk about that. Second is the cost of solar is dropping rapidly, while other technologies are dropping much more slowly. The third is, is that renewables are still a small share of electricity production. This was already seen in the, in the slide in the first presentation. But they're growing at a remarkable pace. And it may actually surprise you how quickly they're growing in many places if you haven't been looking at the statistics lately. Fourth is, in my take, is the future outlook is bright, but there are some pretty important challenges on the horizon that we need to consider. And so again, here I, I am being the economist, bringing in the reality again into how we think about the future. To start, unprecedented investment. <clears throat> the investment in the past five years has really blown away investment prior to that. Looking back to 2010, we were talking about $239 billion spent in new investment in renewable energy globally. It moved up a little bit in 2011, flattened out, and since then has been in the range of $280 billion a year. Much of this is asset finance, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But some of it's coming from public markets, some of it's coming from, from venture capital. Now, this is investment that's going towards all stages that I'm referring to. So we're talking about R&D here. We're talking about early stage startups. But we're also talking about actually funding deployment. And that's what that asset finance is really focusing on. The investment has primarily been going to solar and wind. Probably not surprising to mo most of you. Uh, the growth between 2014 and 2015 of solar was 12%, wind was 4%, so $161 billion into solar. And this is quite interesting because it's showing you where people are actually putting their money, where they believe that the technology is, in reality, making a difference and, and turning out to be economic today. What about venture capital? So there's been, there have been many stories about how venture capital has started out uh, with a boom in clean tech venture capital five years ago, and then a real, real decline since then. Uh, there has been a decline. That is all true. And yet there's still a good amount of money still going in. And where is it going? You can see the largest share here is solar with $2.4 billion. That is by far where venture capitalists and private equity believe that the future lies in terms of medium and short term economically viable startups. A little bit's going to wind, a little bit into biofuels and other areas. But note these numbers are you know, 2.4 billion globally is a pretty small number in general. When you look at uh, public finance, new investment, now public finance here, I mean public market finance. So this is more on the deployment side. So here we're talking about Yield Co's, some of you may have heard about Sun Edison, was a, a company that went bankrupt that was focusing on Yield Co's or, or other project market uh, structured assets that keep in, that capture the value of future flows of monetary gains that come from uh, solar, wind, and other technologies. So they, those were overvalued. There was a little bust in yield codes, but that's still in where a lot of the money is going. And in particular, it's going into solar. So this is primarily the solar 10.1 billion is the US and Europe, is, and much of it is yield codes. Looking around the world, where is new renewables investment by region? So if you can see this, hopefully you can, can get a, a rough sense. The two things to point out, look at the pattern in the United States, slow, steady increase. Look at the pattern, in, and these are all on the same scale, in fact. Look at the pattern in Europe. There was this boom up to 20, 2011, and then a, a drop since then in investment. Now again, this is all investment. So this is investment towards deployment. This is investment towards R&D. This is all investment. China, look at the, the trend you see. Right now, China is investing more in renewables than anywhere else in the world. China alone is investing more in renewables. And that has been a, a dramatic uptick since 2011, when, when Europe peaked. 
So these are the big trends that are underlying what's going on. The United States is holding, holding its own for sure, but the real investment is coming in in China. What's going to be happening going forward in renewables investment? So many of you may be familiar with Mission Innovation and the Breakthrough Energy Coalition. Uh, I was at the White House at the time that Mission Innovation was, was put out. So on November 29th, 2015, 20 countries committed to double their clean energy R&D over five years. This includes 80% of the entire, uh, of, of all emissions, of countries covering 80% of all emissions were in mission innovation. So this is a, you know, United States, China, all the big players, all of Europe are included in this. Doubling clean energy R&D is not gonna be easy, but this is a, aspirational goal, as, as they might put uh, this. This uh, goal would require substantial increases in the DOE budget in the US, substantial increases in the National Science Foundation budget. There are attempts already to start this. Of course, Congress holds, holds the purse strings, so we'll see if the US can meet this going forward. But there is surprising bipartisan support for many of these investments. Breakthrough Energy Coalition is really Bill, B Bill Gates' baby. So Bill Gates called up a bunch of his friends who are high net worth individuals, 28 high net worth individuals around the world, committed to bringing innovations to commercialization. So the way to think about this is mission innovations focused on early stage R&D done on the public dime is a way to think about it. And the Breakthrough Energy Coalition are 28 high net worth individuals who actually hope to make money off of this. They're doing this because they believe it's the right thing, but they really sincerely hope to make money off of this. They didn't want to take some of these innovations and any other innovations that come up to commercialization, to go through what many people talk about as the valley of death. <clears throat> so that gives you a, a big picture of what's been going on in the investment side. What's been happening? What's the reality of the, the pricing right now? Some good news. Some not as good news. One story here is that the global average unsubsidized levelized costs for some technologies have really, really dropped. So this is a chart from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. They do the very best they can to take out all subsidies. These are global numbers, so they don't match. Every country has different numbers. But they're looking here at solar, crystal, and silicon. So you see that as the, the bottom of the four. And that's the one that's dropped most dramatically. 70% actually in, in, some, in the past five years is a, a quote that, that many people uh, use. But you look at the other technologies. Onshore wind, relatively flat, slight decline. Offshore wind actually went up a little bit, then, then a slight decline since then. Parabolic trough with storage, another approach, relatively flat. So one story that emerges just by looking at these numbers is that if you actually look to see what the technology costs are doing, you see that the story lately has been in solar. Why is this? So the stories that are, are dominant in the news, in the, tr the trade press, part of it was that the cost of silicon dramatically dropped in part from reduced demand for electronics, but also in, after the, the Great Recession, but also in part because of a build out, particularly in China, of a large number of very, very large facilities with economies of scale. Uh, there may be other hidden subsidies that are included in this that China, ha we, we do know, provides industrial parks with cheaper electricity and, and great, uh, and a, a variety of other perks those may be hidden in these costs. So do take these with a, with a grain of salt. Well, how's it, what's going on in the United States? In the United States, we can look at utility scale solar. So we, here we have PPA prices. These are power purchase agreement prices. And these are declining fast. Often you'll see in the news, solar is becoming incredibly, incredibly cheap. And you'll see this here in the uh, far right, where you see this dramatic decline since 2008. And, and those circles. Those are our real PPA values, that real contracts that are out there. Now note that a whole variety of subsidies are embedded in these, in these contracts. These contracts, most definitely the developers are taking advantage of the investment tax credit. Most definitely the, the investors are taking uh, advantage of, of any other preferred option, any other subsidies that they can get. 
but we see this, this dramatic decline. So there you're talking $50 per megawatt hour. So when you're talking $50 per megawatt hour, you're, you're really on, on par with a lot of fossil builds. <clears throat> the US onshore wind power purchase agreement prices have been declining relative to wholesale power prices, but you don't see such a dramatic decline that you saw in solar. So here on, on the left, you have MISO. So that's where we, we're on, in MISO right now, to the best of my knowledge. Um, and on the right, you have the Southwest power, Southeast Power Pool. And in both cases, you see the wholesale prices, which are the, the solid line and lots of dots that refer to different power purchase agreement prices for wind that has been coming on. And the dotted line shows the general trend. So you don't see the kind of declines that you see in solar, but there are declines. Again, these are prices for long-term contracts. Yet, given all that, we see prices declining. When analysts have worked hard to try and take away, in a sense, to try and understand what the true technology costs are, and given, this is a very, very tough thing to do. Uh, I can say when I was at the White House at the Council of Economic Advisors, we actually spent a fair bit of time attempting to, to understand the different components of the subsidies and how they contributed. I can't say that we nailed it down because it's, it's actually very complicated. I'd be happy to talk about that as well. The main point to take from this, this here is EIA, the US Energy Information Administration at the Department of Energy's best guess. You have dispatchable energy on the left, so this includes conventional coal, natural gas, combined cycle, advanced natural gas combined cycle, conventional combustion turbines for natural gas, advanced nuclear, geothermal biomass. These are all dispatchable in the sense that if you turn up the knob, they turn up. Then we have the intermittent fuel, so wind, offshore, solar PV. Those costs are all quite a bit higher. These are the 2020 forecasts based largely on, on what uh, today's numbers are. So they've been criticized for these numbers being too high. And their rejoinder to this critique is that, look, we've done the best we can to take out the subsidies. And when you take out the subsidies and try and look just at the true technology costs, they're still coming in a bit higher. So that's the, the dose of reality that, that I, I have to throw in, despite these uh, very impressive trends. When you think about the impressive trends, you do also need to see what's been going on in terms of the, the share. As we saw already, the share is, is very small right now, but it's growing fast. Looking globally to start, the very bottom line, the blue one, tells you the renewable power as a percentage of global power generation. So this is actual generation, not capacity. And what you see here is in 2007, we're talking about 5.2%, and it goes up to 10.3%. This is all renewables, geothermal, small hydro. It does not include large hydro dams. So we're not including the Aswan Dam. We're not, we're not including any of the, the very, very large dams out there. But it does include small hydro. The uh, line up top, the olive color or green color line, shows the capacity change as a percentage of total capacity net. And so this is telling, showing that the capacity change is, is quite large. There has been large percentage increases as you move forward. But as we saw earlier in the first talk, the US is still dominantly coal and natural gas. In 2015, we look at US generation, which is 4.1 terawatt hours, and US capacity, 1.1 terawatts. And we see up in the far left corner of, of each of these two pie charts, we see uh, DPV, which is distributed photovoltaic, and C CSP, and UPV. So UPV is utility photovoltaic, and CSP is, is central, uh, centralized solar. So what we see here, it's this tiny percentage. Combine all of those, you're, you're still under 1% in 2015. Now, I've heard that 2016 is bringing us close up to 1%. The rate of growth is large. Wind is 5% and 7% of capacity. Hydro, which includes large and small hydro, is 6%. But we're still very dominantly coal, natural gas, and nuclear. But as I said, the share of renewables is growing rapidly. So these are the charts that, that the White House loves to put together. Um, I helped put this one together in a Council of Economic Advisors report, but the rate of growth is, is very large. This shows the monthly share of non-hydro renewables in net electricity power generation. And you see this continual upward slope. But you're still below 
10% in the monthly share of non-hydro renewables in total net generation. <clears throat> so globally, more than half of 2015, capacity additions are renewables. So this is when, again, this dramatic growth that we're seeing starting from a very, very small base. Over 50% of the global growth has been these renewables exempting hard, large hydro. And US capacity additions are similar. So that DPV and, and UPV, so distributed photovoltaic and utility scale photovoltaic, was this really, really tiny slice when you looked today. But if you look at the capacity additions in 2015, we're looking at much, much larger percentages. And when you look at capacity additions in 2015, renewables make up well over half, roughly two thirds, in fact. Natural gas is, makes up most of the remaining third. So this shows the direction that the market is going based on signals. And I can bring in a little bit from my own research. There's some evidence of this growth in the research. I've run a whole series of, of field experiments where we examined different programs that got communities together, community-based programs, to encourage solar uh, in communities through a whole series of uh, limited time program, town hall meetings, people talking about solar to each other, and a group pricing deal that they all got. Uh, if you look at these programs, you could just look at the top orange line there. Uh, you see it relatively flat slope of the cumulative number of solar installations in town, and then huge jumps during these times. These programs, called solarized programs, are actually beginning to be adopted across the country in a whole variety of areas. So you've seen them now across the board, North Carolina, South Carolina, California, Alabama, Nevada, although Nevada's definitely changing soon, um, Minnesota, across the board. You've seen these programs in a variety of places. This is all distributed scale solar photovoltaic. So these programs, uh, these are behavioral programs, so I can bring in a, a bit of behavior here, uh, definitely are, are making a difference and are, are playing a role in this uptick of distributed solar. So going forward, what are we going to see? If you look at what Bloomberg New Energy Finance, BNEF, looks at, and, and actually they're not too far off from what the US Energy Information Administration is saying, they see the future projections very bright. Um, <clears throat> They're, they're a major factor. Uh, so a major factor is the direction of the coal market. So by the coal market, I'm actually referring to coal and natural gas here. So how natural gas prices change and reduce coal and change and increase renewables is a major, major factor in what's going on here. What we see is 2016 through 2020, you see uh, their solar is the yellow wind is the blue, those make up a very, very large chunk of annual capacity additions expected in the United States. So these are United States additions. You see a drop after 2020, and this all relates to the Clean Power Plan. And then you see a, a, and, and the Clean Power Plan and actually the drop due to the production tax credit, investment tax credit, and then increasing penetration. So very, very large increases from there. So this is a, a very optimistic view. But a major thing to keep in mind is natural gas prices and where they go. So the assumption underlying this is that natural gas prices are actually going to come up. And much also depends on policy. Unsubsidized costs are still pretty high, as we showed before, because there are a whole series of current implicit and explicit subsidies. So here I do have to come in to the reality check again, uh, that we have the investment tax credit. This was extended through Dece in December 2015 through 2022. It steps down gradually to 2022. We have, and that applies primarily to solar projects. We have the production tax credit extended in December 2015, and now it steps down gradually to apply to wind products beginning construction before 2019. When I was speaking to people uh, who were deeply involved, analysts as well as people in the industry, during the time when these discussions were underway, they, they couldn't emphasize how important these two policies are for extending the capacity growth of renewables. Not surprising at all. And the next bullet point I have there is EPA Clean Power Plan. Now that's in the courts now. We'll see if it holds up, but if you look at EIA's projections, the Energy Information Administration's projections, 
the clean power plant turns out to be a very, very critical component to the amount of growth that you're going to see in renewables going forward. They have a, a baseline without the clean power plant and a baseline with the clean power plant. And the you see almost double renewables by, by 2030 relative to double renewables growth relative to what you would have had without the clean power plan. And that is in the courts. I, would, I expect it to hold up, given the Supreme Court makeup right now, but, but we shall see. Um, then there are a whole variety of state renewable portfolio uh, RPS policies, so renewable portfolio standard policies, and a variety of net metering policies, which are particularly important for solar. So the clean power plan, just to reemphasize how important this may be, you can look across and see the cuts that are required under the Clean Power Plan. These are the emissions reductions required by the Clean Power Plan between 2012 and 2030. So for some states, it's relatively small. California is negative 3%, and that's largely because they've done so much already and are doing so much already. And other states, similar, Connecticut, New York, relatively small, and then some states, it's, it's much larger. Texas, you have 25% cut, Wyoming, 37%, Montana, 41% cut. Part of the reason that these differences are so uh, dramatic between states is that some states, the states have very, very different electricity systems. There's not too much to cut in California, whereas Montana is primarily on coal, and so there's a heck of a lot that to potentially cut there. But there's also a lot going on with net energy metering. So many of you may have heard about uh, what, happen what uh, has been happening in Nevada, for example, where there's been a, a great deal of discussion. So net energy metering allows, if you put a solar panel on your roof, that allows you to sell back to the utility during times that you're not using the power. There are a variety of different state laws. Some, some, some states don't have any law in it at all. Some states have laws that allow you to be compensated at the retail rate. Many states have laws that allow you to be compensated at some lower rate. What this diagram is showing is where a lot of the action is that's the pushback that has been occurring against net energy metering regulations with the argument that utilities say, well, wait, if we're compensating you at the retail rate, who's going to pay for all the transmission and distribution? They're worried about a utility death spiral is, is the, the argument that has come up quite a bit. So these are the state policy barriers throughout the country. As penetrations of renewables, stepping back and thinking bigger picture at the longer term, as high penetrations, uh, at high penetrations of renewables, intermittency really starts to matter. So you look at uh, system-wide wind and solar. And the graph on the left is showing you how solar generates during the day and wind generates during a typical day in ERCOT. Now, wind can be all over the place. Solar, this is actually very, very typical. What you see is a real drop off in the, the late afternoon. So you, there's uh, a coincidence with the peak hours during, t during that time, but there's a real drop off. And so that leads to this curve on the right called the duck curve. This duck curve is on net load. So this is the, 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 the load, the demand from consumers, minus the production from wind or solar. And this is primarily focusing on solar here. So if, you try, so if you look at the load right there, the first line, 2012, this is an example for in the California ISO, so this is a, from California. You see the green line, which is telling you what California's typical load looked like in, on March, thir, March 31st in 2012. You see that the peak is kind of actually early in the day, and there's a bit of a peak late in the day. The worry is, and then look at it in 2016, and the difference. That difference is primarily because of the amount of solar that has come on. You see it much, much flattened. And you see a, a, a slightly higher peak, actually, later in the day. So there was load growth. More people buying more appliances, more things. But solar has brought down the peak in the day. The reason why people care about the duck curve is when you look to the 2020 forecast. And that's an estimated forecast. There you see a very, very steep ramping between the hours of 16 and 18. So in those late afternoon, evening hours, when the sun starts going down, you start to see a very, very steep ramp up. And that very steep ramp up turns out to be quite expensive to the system. So intermittency starts to really matter because it raises costs to the system when you bring on large penetrations of renewables. 
The Council of Economic Advisors wrote a report on this, and I know there's an, an afternoon discussion, so maybe I'm setting the stage for the afternoon discussion about incorporating renewables into the electric grid, where we looked at the economic aspects of incorporating renewables into the grid. Uh, the left-hand side is the report itself. On the right-hand side is one of the graphs from the report that points out that at least so far, it hasn't appeared to be an issue yet. This is looking at uh, ancillary service costs. So ancillary services are a, a broad term, but they tell you something about where the costs would lie from this intermittency. Ancillary services costs include capacity costs, so the cost of holding capacity online, having it ready to ramp up when needed. And you see very, very little relationship so far between variable energy penetration and the average ancillary service costs. But when we looked deeper in that report into particular times and particular places, you could see places where the ancillary service costs are starting to rise in places with very, very high penetrations of renewables. So this is where you're going to start to see the costs. The point here, so far it's not a big deal, but it could be a big deal going forward. Thinking about it from that perspective, it's important to consider what other technologies could play a role. And the report emphasized uh, smart markets. These are communications technologies, demand response technologies, uh, smart home technologies, and, and energy storage technologies as well as, as potentially playing a very, very important role if we start increasing to high penetrations of renewables. So some final thoughts. 2015 was a watershed year for renewables in both the United States and globally. It's also happened to be a record year for coal retirements. There are tentative signs of a, a more permanent shift. Natural gas and renewables displacing coal continued trend upwards of renewable builds. Power sector emissions were 18% below 2005 levels, and everything we see from 2016 shows, does show a continuation. But when you go forward, there are some very important challenges. Um, in the short run, continued lo low natural gas prices, unless the cost of renewables continue dropping. And as we saw, they were relatively flat for, men for wind and, and some of the other technologies. So if you have continued low natural gas prices without continued policy support, you're going to continue to see, uh, you'll see builds and growth, but I imagine it will start leveling out without that policy support. So in the short and long run, continued policy support is going to be quite important. And in the long run, uh, the development of enabling technologies to deal with intermittency is uh, going to be quite important. So with that, I thank you all. Mm -hmm. Questions for Ken. When you showed that uh, the plot of the unsubsidized cost of different generation, um, you had like a central value and then bar. Mm -hmm. Could you just mention what those things mean exactly? Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great point in that there's a lot of heterogeneity in what costs, what the costs are actually going to be based on where. So one, one example of this is, is NREL has National Renewable Energy Laboratory as an annual technology baseline. And they have different grades of the costs and which renewables are going to come in. They spent a lot of time thinking about this. What determines what grade the renewables come in? It's everything from location. So obviously that, that's important, how easy it is to get the materials there, uh, what the source of labor supply is in those places, whether it's union labor or not, all of those things do play a, a key role. But beyond that, it, it also is a, a question of technologies do vary as well, uh, and exactly what technology they choose to put in plays a role. So those large uh, bands are made up of all of those things, encapsulating large heterogeneity in the costs. Great talk, and maybe this is related to the previous question, but in talking about smarter grids and communication technology and so forth, um, has there been in either the June report or um, some other sources that you trust an estimate of how much of the levelized cost of energy for intermittent renewables would be grid transformation, I guess to put it crudely? Is this going to be a, a big chunk of cost, and is it being captured in these uh, in these estimates? So I would say first, the, the answer to the last question is no, it's not being captured at all in any of these estimates. The extent to which it's going to be a large cost is a really, really deep and great, great question. If you take today's technologies and try to put on very high penetrations of renewables, it really matters what other what the rest of the grid looks like. It really, really matters. So say you're Denmark and you're well connected to the rest of Europe. You can get 90% renewables 
it's pretty amazing because you have lots of transmission lines connecting you to hydro in Norway, transmission lines into Germany, there's a large grid that you're connected to. You can really get high percentages of renewables. And we've seen days with very, very high percentages of renewables in Denmark. If you have a grid in which you have lots of lots and lots of hydro, except for those drought years uh, that it may occur occasionally, the cost could be quite low because it's highly dispatchable. Natural gas is also highly dispatchable. So part of the reason why when we looked at those uh, ancillary service costs, they actually varied more with how the, the builds of, of natural gas were looking, natural gas prices, whether it was a drought year and hydro. So far, those are the dominant forces. As you continue, hydro is somewhat of a limit, in, at least in the United States, although there are builds elsewhere. But as you continue to grow up, go and increase the penetration of renewables much further, it starts to become a, a great, and, and pushing out even natural gas, it starts to become a bigger and bigger question. I don't have a, an answer to exactly what percentage that will be, but it could be relatively high if you have to keep on other plants that are there simply to provide capacity during those off times. And if you have to, hold on to those plants much longer than you would have otherwise. Uh, so I have not seen the, the full answer to that question, but there are a whole variety of really important factors that play a role. You, you really spoke, uh, it was a really excellent talk, but one thing that is really important is the role of subsidies and how important they are in keeping the system going. And to me, there are two questions I'd like to ask you. First, is a little bit about the political economy. What behind the subsidy? Second, you mentioned a very interesting point, labor union. To me, solar is very attractive because we have a huge problem of unemployed males. And solar is very attractive because it solved the problem. So to some extent, to what extent uh, a lot of the policies reflect technological change and climate change versus to what extent they reflect this is cheap way to, do, to generate new employment when you look good? That, that's a great question. I think it varies depending on whether I'm answering this from the national or state level. I actually think that at the national level, I will say it's the conversation is dominated much more by climate change, although there are these other workforce, in quotes, green workforce issues that, that play a role in the discussion. Uh, at the state level, I actually think it's, it's even more dominated by employment. You do have to employ a fair number of people to, to go up and put solar panels on. Um, that may not be the most efficient way to employ them if you're looking if you take out climate change considerations entirely, there may be more efficient policies to employ them, as an economist speaking. But that said, it is one way to employ them, perhaps. That, that does absolutely play a role. And then your second question, or your, actually your first question, was about subsidies. Why do they come about? And, and they, they're coming about from, from really two areas. And the national policies are, are the tax credits. They actually appear to be quite, quite popular. Why do they appear to be quite popular? Because there are renewables being built in states across the country with, there's, there's somewhat bipartisan support actually for uh, many of these extenders. Now I, I can get into a little bit more detail. Those, those extenders in December 2015 were a compromise. There were some things that the Democrats wanted and there were some things that the Republicans wanted. And uh, the Republicans really wanted uh, oil exports to be permitted, so crude oil to be allowed to be exported from the United States. They got that, and their cost was these extenders and a few other things. So that's a more, more detailed political uh, background behind those tax extenders. But frankly, they weren't so opposed to them. And that's because of this political economy that there's a heck of a lot of wind being built in a variety of states that would be considered red states. Now, at the state level, it gets much, much more complicated because there are a variety of different factors that are, uh, that are in, in play there, including these, these workforce factors, including uh, different groups that uh, are particularly strong in certain states, including California, for that matter. Uh, but it, it's, it's hard to give a general answer because it varies so much by state. Could you speak a little bit more about the impacts the EPA clean power plan might have on investment, capacity addition, and prices, things like that? Yes. It's, I can give a, a, a tentative answer. And the reason why, I, I, let me start with why I'm giving a tentative answer. The clean power plan is a state level plan in some sense. It is a national policy, but it provides every state with the ability to set up their own plans. And if they don't choose to do any of the other plans, then they default to the federal plan. So if they don't put forth their own plan, they default to the federal plan. 
most states are going to put forward their own plan, although many say they're not going to until they're going to wait till, to see how it goes, plays out in the courts. But presuming it plays out in the courts, I would expect most states to put forward their own plan. So it can go a variety of different ways. States have a choice between a mass-based plan, which is effectively a cap and trade, linking with other states, or having a rate-based plan, and that would be an emissions intensity plan, in a sense. The implications are actually quite different between those two. Um, they're designed to be as close as possible, but there are a variety of factors that would differ depending on whether states form coalitions, what leakage would occur, et cetera. What I will say is, under the expectation that states form mass-based plans, those are the ones that are slightly more economically, are, are more economic, well, not slightly more, they are more economically efficient, they allow uh, there to be trading, there are a variety of reasons that they would be the lowest cost way to do it. Suppose a lot of states did that. You could look at what Bloomberg New Energy Finance assumes when they do their analysis of what the effective carbon price would be in many states. States like California and the Northeast, that effective carbon price is, is zero. And that's because those states are doing so much anyway. When we look at states like Montana and others, the effective carbon price is more like $20 per ton of CO2. So there, there would be a real incentive because of the clean power plan for new renewable builds. Whereas when you look elsewhere, you're talking about no additional incentive because of the clean power plan. All the incentive is because of state level incentives, other you know, renewable portfolio standards, et cetera. Okay, thanks, Ken. Let's thank Ken one more time for his talk.